Hello and welcome to another episode of the Meat Mafia podcast. On today's episode, the Meat Mafia is joined by Nick Norowitz. Nick holds a PhD in physiology, anatomy, and genetics from Oxford University, and he's currently studying at Harvard Medical School. In today's episode, Nick and Salazzo dive into their shared journeys of putting ulcerative colitis into remission through an animal-based, low-carb diet. The conversation addresses some of the social limitations, physical, and psychological struggles of battling an autoimmune disease like ulcerative colitis. The disease has been on the rise in young men, so we hope this episode sheds some light on the struggles as well as the possibility to overcome the condition through intentional lifestyle changes. This is a great conversation with a lot of vulnerable and honest feedback from two people who have put this disease in remission. So if you're struggling with something like this, this is the episode for you, so sit back and enjoy. All right, we are here with another episode of the Meat Mafia podcast. Uh, I'm your co-host, Salazzo, joined by my partner in crime, Clemenza. Um, we have a very special guest, Nick Norwitz, who connected with us off of Twitter. Um, Nick, how are you? Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're excited to, to have you here. This is, another, this is another example of just the great connections that can be formed off of Twitter. We have a, we have a close mutual friend, Doug Reynolds, who runs Low Carb USA. So for anyone that doesn't know Doug, should definitely check out his podcast. He does fantastic work. Um, and I remember, Nick, when I first met Doug, he was telling me about some of the amazing work that, that you've been doing specifically at, at Harvard. And I know that you work pretty closely with Dave Feldman. Um, and we figured out that we both have a, a very common, uh, not so common coincidence that we both have ulcerative colitis. We've dealt with it for around the same period of time. Just a lot of like very interesting coincidences. Um, so for the audience, I think it would be great, Nick, just to give a little background on who you are what you do, and then just to dig into your own personal story, uh, overcoming ulcerative colitis, and then, um, you know, using a low carb, leveraging a low carb pr- approach. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Um, and just for the listeners, I, um, yeah, I, I heard, so um, I heard Brett on um, Low Carb USA, you go by Solozo here. What's the deal with the, the code names? Out of curiosity. Yeah, so, so the, you take that. Yeah, the, the backstory was, uh, in December, started writing for uh, a, a d- separate Twitter account. Um, he's he goes by Texas Slim, and and I was writing ab- about regenerative agriculture and the effects that it, it could have on the food system. Mm-hmm. And so his premise was, you know, he was writing under a, a, a like anonymous name. Uh, I, he he was for it, so I, I basically just followed suit and came up with some anonymous name that just so happened to be a, a mobster. And then Brett and I both started writing about the food system in January. And, um, you know, we kind of just rolled with it. We came up with the concept of the meat mafia, just as like a funny shtick to, to uh, write behind. And it's, uh, it's been fun. Just, I mean, we're, we're now like pseudo anonymous, not really not taking it too seriously, but uh, it's, it's fun kind of having the, the branding aspect of it and think that it plays well to all the topics that we, we choose to write about. So. Awesome. Well, um, well, how should I refer to you each during <laughs> first names is first names. Yeah. Is fine. All right. I yeah. call yeah, you by your real names if that's okay. And totally. Clemenza slash Harry. My, yeah. my, my code assignment for you to mull over in the back of your head while we're doing this episode is uh, a code name for me. Oh, excellent. I'll, I'll come up with a good one. Um, I'll come up with a good one because we're going to need you in the fold here. I think we were talking before the episode that we're going to make this in, in two parts uh, and really focus this episode on your guys' story where both of you guys have this shared experience of overcoming or, or managing, I guess is probably the better way of saying it, the, your guys' issues with colitis. And mm-hmm. I think it's probably something that a lot of listeners, whether they realize it or not, are probably dealing with similar, you know, similar digestive issues, whether it's colitis, IBS, Crohn's. And I, I, I'm interested in, in getting the feedback from you guys, but also the audience in terms of um, the, the benefits that just kind of being a little bit more open about this line of conversation, because I think it's something people probably shy away from just given the nature of, of the autoimmune issue. For mm-hmm. sure. So, um, no, I'm, I'm super excited to talk about this issue, especially when I heard, I heard Brett's story on um, Low Carb USA. I knew I had to talk to him because the parallels were like eerie. And so maybe we can touch on some of those. 
Um, but it really spoke to just the experience I had, which I guess we can get into now. Um, but I actually want to start in, if that's okay, in media res with, um, with, I, I just had a conversation. So, so I don't know if we mentioned right now I'm at Harvard bed, um, and, you know, just doing standard medical school curriculum. And we did GI recently and we had a panel on gastrointestinal diseases mm -hmm. panel with like esteemed professors at, at Harvard and elsewhere. And there was a period afterwards where I just, I just stayed the other like 160 people left and it was me and some professors. And I just wanted to ask the question. I said, I wanted to ask them like, you know, in your practice, do you ever use ketogenic diets or carnivore diets or restricted diets for ulcerative colitis? I realize it's not standard of care. I realize there aren't clinical controlled studies on it, but when I look around, in the community around me, it's, it's surprising the number of people, not just you and me, but who have used um, these forms of ketogenic or carnivore diets with immense improvements in these gastrointestinal diseases on the spectrum from Crohn's, colitis, to just IBS. And I wanted to know what their clinical mm -hmm. experiences were. Um, and no surprise, I mean, it's not something that they recommend, but um, it was really interesting. Uh, interesting. I just wanted to, to point out, we like, you know, had the discussion and, and the professors and I were pointing out that the literature on this is really advancing. Like there was just a paper in Nature uh, a couple of days ago, I think it was like April 27, 2020, about beta hydroxybutyrate um, suppressing colon cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of like basic science literature, not per se clinical trials, but building the biological um, plausibility for how these sorts of diets could really be beneficial. Mm -hmm. or gastrointestinal diseases. So um, I, that was an interesting conversation for me because I just, I knew it wasn't clinical practice, but be, to be able to have a conversation with, uh, you know, clinical experts, so to speak, and to see that they were open to it really mm -hmm. made me feel comfortable. That, that was going to be my question. Were they engaging on it? Were they open to it? They were really grateful. They said, you know, thank you so much for asking these questions like obviously because it's you know there aren't the clinical trials we can't per se recommend it but um you know it's surprising that it, you know physicians really are open to seeing how um patients or in this case students have experiences and they bank those in their mind because i think i know that there you know there's a lot of doc bashing on twitter whatever and social media but like almost every physician i've ever met just wants their patients to improve um, and they just don't have experience with helping patients with the kind of uh, interventions that we've tried out of self-experimentation, desperation um, to great success. So if they're working for patients, I think most clinicians are very open-minded to it. My professors have been, um, honestly, throughout my professors have been very open-minded to my, what would be considered maybe more unconventional ideas. And I was a little bit worried going into med school, I'd be a pariah, but um, my peers and my professors have been incredibly receptive, which has been so uplifting um made me feel really optimistic about the future so it's amazing yeah. but nick maybe if uh if you wanted to take a step back and sort of tell us your story as it relates to your ulcerative colitis you know when did you start yeah realizing things were off you know in, in brett's story we, we've told it a few times on the podcast but brett i'd love to have you tell your story again and just see really see the, the parallels between how this autoimmune issue takes hold and starts to really like uh, affect affect the day to day lives of a lot of young men. Mm -hmm. women. Yeah, um, I'll just start talking then. And since I have a, a tendency to run my mouth, please, we need to get your hand up when you no. want to interject. So I'm run run it. Run it. Talk. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, it was like I had no health issues until really around, you know, around 20. There were some other things going on, but like super healthy on the surface. Um, wasn't like a D1 athlete, but I was pretty athletic, you know, um, marathon runner, triathlete, um, various other sports. Mm -hmm. And um, always just of the mindset, the standard mindset that like, look, I'm, I'm lean, I'm healthy. I can kind of eat a little bit liberally and really not have issues. If I want some ice cream, I'll have some ice cream. Uh -huh. uh, but, you know, as long as I, you know, hit my macro goals, 
fuel my activity and eat sufficient nutrients, you know, get my five a day, get my protein, then I should be fine. Everything mm-hmm. else is just extra. I can burn it off. Kind of standard mindset. Um, then when I was a junior in college, I did my undergrad at Dartmouth. I started having like these weird stomach pains um, after eating that I had never experienced before. I had never had food aversions. I could eat anything. My stomach was a trash compactor, and I just started having really weird stomach pains after eating. And they just kept on getting worse and worse and worse. Um, and then started coming with blood, mm-hmm. um, which was kind of disconcerting. Mm-hmm. To kind of fast forward a little bit, my senior year, it got so bad that basically anything I ate caused severe bleeding. Um, and I started to get just, you know, uncomfortable and, and uh, afraid of eating basically anything. I just didn't really want to eat, but I forced myself to eat, um, you know, obviously just because you have to eat. And it was around that time I got some colonoscopies. I ended up having three that year. I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis and then um, started to you know, just engage in the standard therapies that you get prescribed. None of them were really having a huge impact and things were still getting worse um, to the point that I was. Nick, I'm sorry. I don't mean to cut you off. Can you, do you mind just giving a quick definition of what ulcerative colitis is for the audience that may not be familiar with it? Yeah. So uh, in terms of gut diseases, there are IBSs, irritable bowel syndrome, which is kind of a a catch-all term for, uh, gastrointestinal issues that aren't quite diseases with diagnosable pathologies in the IBD space. So that to separate the IBS from the IBD, the IBDs, inflammatory bowel diseases, are those where you can look in the stomach and see inflammatory pathology. So for Crohn's disease, there is more widespread pathology in the small intestine and the colon. And also colitis is more localized to the colon, to the large intestine. And like the name suggests, you do have ulcers. You have these um, holes basically open up in your colon out of which you bleed. So then you end up with blood in your stool. And it can be extremely painful um, and cause, you know, the urge to go to the bathroom at unpredictable times. Um, so lots of pain and it really inter- in, in, uh, impacts your ability to engage socially um, mm-hmm. or really just anything. I mean, my academics were really impacted. I was always a good test taker. But it got to the point where, like, I'm not worried about choosing the right answer on a multiple choice. I'm worried about, like, bleeding out my anus mid-test and having to run out of the room. That kind of fear. Yeah. Um, going to the dining hall or going on a date or whatever. Going on a bike ride with a triathlon team and having, like, an urge. And having to, like, stop and go to the side of the road into the woods and just, like, poop blood in the woods. Which, I've honestly, I've had to do. Um, mm-hmm. Or... Um, if you want the most extreme example, um, it was graduation. Um, I was, uh, my senior year, the, the valedictory speaker, um, which was cool. And it meant I had the chance to speak in front of 11,000 people. And I'd never spoken in a crowd that size. And at this point, my friends really didn't know I had all sort of colitis. And I really wasn't public with anybody about how severe it had gotten and how scared I was. But um, I think like a lot of people with, with this condition and, and Brett, you can um, probably attest to this as well. Mm-hmm. You become very good at hiding it and putting on a brave face mm. and, and, um, and acting like everything's okay when you're just suffering inside. So in this is, instance, um, you know, I, I had an opportunity that I wanted to take and the measures to which I went to achieve this were you know, I fasted for 36 hours and I'd never, I'd never really fasted at this point. Um, so that was quite extreme for me. And then like get up at three o'clock, give myself a coffee enema just to make sure I was completely cleared out. So I could go up there and not have an event and try to smile. It was so nerve wracking. And again, you know, I'm not per se a confident public speaker, but all my anxiety was not from having to get up and speak in front of people. It was this possibility in my mind that I could literally have like a micro flare right there, have a bleeding event televised in front of my entire college, all the parents recorded for YouTube and go viral like that. So there's this in my mind to get these opportunities. And I'm like, how can I say no? I don't want to say no out of fear 
to not have this opportunity. But at the same time, this is a very real possibility. Yeah. Uh, and that tears you up inside, even if you don't show it. Um, that's one example, but that kind of thing happens over and over again. And the psychological toll for me, I don't know how it was for you, Brett, but like, it's so much worse than the physical pain or the bleeding or the weight loss, the impact on athletics. It's really the fact that like every single experience is colored by this fear around your gut. Your entire life starts to cycle around it. Where are the bathrooms? How can I strategize so I can pretend like I'm living life and enjoying it? And everybody else thinks that I'm living life and enjoying it. And I look successful, blah, blah, blah. When nobody really knows on the inside, I'm just kind of tortured. And my cortisol is through the roof. Is it something that you felt your peers, close friends were aware of? Or was it something that you were really that actively um, just trying to protect and, and make sure that you were still just doing your normal day-to-day thing? It was more, more the latter. Um, not that I didn't think my friends could handle it and support me, but it was just like the culture around being a young male in college where if you were open about your experiences and, and having to come to face the fact that you had certain limitations, you wouldn't be able to engage in a lot of things mm-hmm. that you wanted to engage in. Um, just the culture around going to the dining hall after working out with triathlon team and, you know, guys being guys, you just like, you know, there's some virtual signaling about how much you can eat and this, that, right. and the other not even like really verbalized. It's just an unspoken thing. Yeah. And so I didn't want to be there like picking at a restrictive, whatever. It would just kind of, I, I didn't even really, I didn't really even think about it and process it. It was just kind of the default mode I went into. It's like, I still gotta be this like engage, you know, engaged college student, peer, normal person. Yeah. I don't want to be thought of as the, the sick kid. Right. You know, among my friend group, but Brett, is that a similar experience to you? I know we've talked about this a bunch, but I think it would be great to get your color on just how it, you know, the autoimmune issues that you dealt with affected you socially. And, and just like, I I think the psychological aspect of it is something that is really underappreciated by people who don't have to deal with something like this. Yeah. And the interesting thing about ulcerative colitis or Crohn's or IBS or some of these other autoimmune issues to Nick's point, it's that they're very easy to hide, right? Because we're kind of trained by society. Like you, you, you can, you can tell that someone's metabolically unhealthy just by the way that they look right. The quality of their skin, are they overweight, et cetera. But for all intents and purposes, like maybe someone with colitis, you could tell that they're losing weight or their neck is a little bit thinner, you know, which I ended up losing like over 20 pounds, but that was over the, the course of a few months that I was, and I was flaring, but I was really able to hide this from my, my parents and my friends. And to Nick's point, like, I don't know if it was, there was probably some embarrassment there. And there was also just like this dumb invince, like maybe this invincibility complex of like, Oh, I'm bleeding, but it'll be fine. And then it gets to a point where it's like things progress and you're going to the bathroom 10, 20 plus times a day straight blood and then at that point it's just you know you just have full-blown ulcerative colitis and it's too late for you so um i think mine was definitely partially stress induced with playing college baseball nick i'm curious if you think that i'm just curious you said you were a great test taker do you think that the stress of you being pre-med brought on any of this or do you think you were maybe genetically predisposed to it how do you feel about that yeah i mean one can always speculate the what ifs. What if I did this differently? What if I did yeah. that differently? I had a lot of hits against me. For example, like I was C-section delivery, got IV antibiotics as a neonate. These are all things that are known to really skyrocket your increases. Mm. I've developed an ulcerative colitis later in life. We don't know why it occurs. Like why should it getting IV antibiotics, you know, in your first year of life, increase your risk of getting ulcerative colitis in your 20s by 500%? Doesn't really make sense, but it does. Um, so I, I don't know the anxiety probably didn't help, Mm -hmm. um, but it's one of those things. It's like, it was always going to be part of my life. I want to go do an MD, PhD, be a physician scientist, go, you know, be pre-med. This is going to come with some stress. Same with, you know, playing, uh, college baseball. It's like, it's going to come with stress. Stress is part of life. And so it's not like I'm going to go be a monk and, and try to, you know, meditate five hours a day and relax. It doesn't really just seem plausible. What's going to manifest is going to manifest. It um, doesn't mean I can't manage stress better, but I think the why getting ulcerative colitis is, yeah, for, for me, it's not a question that I really dwell on. Um, 
the fact of the matter is it just it manifests it, and then what do you do with it then and like you said there's kind of this invincibility complex that you don't want to give up that identity um and i think for both of us actually while you, you were a more competitive athlete it sounds like it's like i i did identify myself as an athlete by that point i had I actually set a state push-up record. I was doing like sub three marathons. Like I was pretty athletic and I was like, that's how I define myself. I don't want to be like, I don't want to face the fact that I'm actually at that point, a relatively sick person and getting worse. Mm -hmm. Um, And the fact that I didn't face that uh, meant I wasn't really able to address it. And within a couple of years, now fast forwarding a bit, a bit to after graduation, it got to the point where it was so bad like you, I lost 20 pounds. I was entirely emaciated. I could barely do athletics and getting up and walking to lab was an effort. I ended up in the ICU at one point with a heart rate in the twenties. It was like, I completely lost everything with respect to my physical capacity. Um, and maybe it was inevitable, but it wasn't something I wanted to face until I was forced into it, which eventually I was. Mm -hmm. What's interesting to me is contrasting what it must've felt like being on a college campus where everyone's trying to assimilate, everyone's trying to be social. That aspect to me, you know, if both of you guys were realizing these issues in your 20s and then they progressively got worse quickly, just the challenge of being on a college campus in today's world, what college looks like, it, it must have been it must have been incredibly challenging to to navigate that. Yeah. I, I wouldn't even, I don't know about you, but like maybe college came with particular challenges. I wouldn't even think about it like that. I think we were just being like an engaged person. I think you could generalize it beyond, beyond college. Yeah. Uh, I, I was never really one to, to give in to peer pressure. I was never a big drinker. That wasn't part of my MO. It was just not wanting to people, if you had the ability to cover this up, it was just the default mode um, because I guess you're going to suffer with it anyway, right? So, so why reveal that? Why look? Mm-hmm. Why, right? You know, why play the sick person? But the point of the fact of the matter is, I was not happy. I was absolutely miserable. I wouldn't say I was depressed, but I was, you know, thinking back on it, like it was just a matter of surviving every day, just being like, you know, getting through, getting to the next step. Nothing was really enjoyable anymore. It really just leached all the enjoyment out of it. And I just, just kind of kept trucking until I was at the point, like I said, where I just, it, it literally became so debilitating that I wasn't able to even progress in the way that I wanted to, in this case, academically. So I graduated college and I felt like I had so much potential. I had so much laid out in front of me. So at this mm-hmm. point, after graduating, I had a place to Harvard Med that I had deferred. I got a scholarship to Oxford. So I was there getting a PhD and it was like, I feel like I should be the happiest and I, you know, luckiest person in the world because I was able to, you know, seem like I I had a lot to live for, but it was at that point where like, I can't even get up and go study. I just can't. I'm too tired. My brain isn't working. I have terrible brain fog, terrible stomach pain. I can't carry out my studies. I can't go to these amazing lectures by people like, Jennifer Doudna, of all, like people like the, just came through that were the superstars of science. And I couldn't enjoy those moments because I was just sick. Mm. Um, and so it got to the point where it was so bad that I just had to kind of start to play with other options that weren't convention. And mm-hmm. again, I've said this a million times, but it wasn't out of expectation. It wasn't like I had gone down the internet rabbit hole and was like, oh, I am confident carnivore or keto is going to help me. It was like, I've tried everything else. Things are so shitty at this point. I just, I have nothing to lose by trying this one more thing, even if it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, So by the point I had tried keto, I had tried every other diet in the book, including the ones that are more standardly prescribed for UC, like bread, I'm sure you've tried specific carbohydrate diet, low fat, oh. things like plant-based. I mean, I had tried it all and keto was really at the bottom of my plausibility list, but I just tried it. And for me, it really was like a light switch. It was within a week. I was feeling so much better. The blood went away. My mind was back. I was still pretty emaciated, but I had a lot more energy. Um, 
And then to my surprise, when we rechecked my inflammatory markers, something called calprotectin, which is a stool marker of inflammation, it had dropped like eightfold. Wow. In coordination with me just feeling a lot better. And I'm like, huh, maybe there's something to this. Mm. Um, and it was really like, you know, since that point, other than on three occasions, twice, when I tried to really push out back out of ketosis with carbs, and then once when I got mold poisoning, since going into ketosis, I have not had significant flare issues, um, which is pretty remarkable for me. And um, what's even more remarkable for me is, you know, I always thought a lot of things have happened to me and I kind of just assumed that I am just an N equals one, that I am just a medical zebra. And I would respond a little bit curiously, but I keep on hearing these stories like Brett's. Um, and like a lot of other people's where you see the similar motif of somebody with a metabolic disease is disappointed in the results they're having with a conventional approach. And they try carbohydrate restriction, ketogenic carnivore, something along that spectrum and have remarkable improvements and gain back the quality of life that they never imagined they could have again. Mm -hmm. And it just disappeared as a possibility. And the fact that I'm seeing that motif over and over and over again, really makes me think as a patient, um, as a scientist and just intellectual and as someone who is at the, you know, beginning of starting a medical education. So I have like this interesting position where I can come at it from kind of three angles, yeah. the academic angle, the patient angle and the, the medical trainee angle and ask kind of, you know, if there is something to this and based on the collection of stories and the biological plausibility, I think there is, then why isn't it something that's talked about more, at least in conventional circles? Mm -hmm. uh, but just that that question, that seat of a question, is is, is where I. It, and Nick, have you have you ever asked? I'm sure you have. When you ask yourself, you know, how would you how would you answer that question? Why is it not talked about more in traditional Western medicinal circles? Because the bar the standard of evidence that's required to prescribe interventions is generally randomized controlled trials, like top tier evidence. And there is not the resources or the will to do these trials for these conditions. Mm -hmm. To do a good randomized controlled trial for a ketogenic diet and ulcerative colitis, it, it hasn't been done. It's not that it couldn't be done. It's not that it's been tried and the results have been negative. It's just mm -hmm. that it's never really seriously been tried and it'd be a hard trial to do. And until a trial like that is done on scale, you're not going to have doctors prescribing it. And you're not even going to have people try to do that study until you have doctors kind of, you know, maybe starting to experiment with it. And they're not going to start to experiment with it until they're comfortable with it as a concept or even comfortable with ketogenics as a concept. And just because of the media spin that's put on ketogenic diets or carnivore diets and the lack of knowledge around them, you are not going to have clinicians, you know, except for a few renegade clinicians, even experimenting with it. And those mm -hmm. clinicians are typically not the, typically, not always, the academic scientists who are going to be the ones to push and run the trial. There are a few exceptions to that. And I think we're making some progress with some things I can't really speak about that might be ongoing or about to get started. But like, it's just because the study hasn't been done. Mm. Um, whereas it's a lot easier for, you know, a big pharma company to, to run an RCT with a, the drug, get a standard of care and then have the doctor just prescribe it. It's a, a lot easier. Um, mm -hmm. and, and also helping patients start diets and getting them to stick to those diets is extremely difficult. Um, when you only have very limited time to talk to a patient. Mm. And motivate yeah, so to change and completely kind of shift the way they look at things. Mostly people will find these things from online communities um, and kind of go, you know, circumvent standard practice rather than working with their physician. It's just the nature of things. I think yeah. that's a really important point to emphasize the nature of how the medical industry is set up where like a diet is going to have is probably likely to have less of a downside risk, but is the standard of evidence that they're looking for the same? Because it, it would appear to me that like the downside of trying a keto, ketogenic diet is way different than the downside of trying some pharmaceutical drug that ultimately might have some side effects. Um, whereas the upside, 
as you both have experienced, is equal or better because you don't have to pay for the pharmaceuticals and you can maintain your lifestyle just by eating a certain way. I would agree there's lesser downside, but I, I just don't think clinicians are comfortable because they don't have experience like prescribing these diets. They don't know about them because yeah. they're not taught about it. It's just not part of the discussion. You really don't talk about diet in medical school like at all. So while you have like dozens and dozens of hours on pharmacology and you can you know do the research on the drugs and prescribe them in what you consider a safe manner to go to a patient and say, cut out carbs when you know nothing and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm making broad sweeps here. I think some physicians are extremely educated and interested in nutrition, but in general, when you don't know that much about a given dietary intervention, or you just think, you know, carnivore or, or keto is equivalent to what you see on the magazine covers of people eating just like meat and cheese and no fruits and veg, which some people do, but it's not necessarily the case. It's not going to be the thing you prescribe. It's just taboo to do so. Um, so it, it just, it just doesn't get tried again, except for a few renegades. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and, and for me, it's like, it's just not part of the, the culture to really talk about diet. Actually. It's really interesting because mm -hmm. like I'm, I'm walking through the halls of the, these hospitals where I'm going to be doing my clerkships. I, and, and, and the food stuff, it's just, that's ironic. It's pervasive in terms of like the culture around food, you think in hospitals, there'd be emphasis on quality and nutrition, but like you should see hospital menus. They're absolutely gross. Terrible. And, yes, and, and you know, and it's just all part of, it's all just all like, it's something that people acknowledge, but don't really care about it. I point out to someone like, look, this patient, like it says on the board right there, they have a fasting blood sugar of 217 and they're being served chocolate cake and mashed potatoes. It's insane. And, not. and they're like, yeah, that's a problem. All right, let's move on. Like there's not, a, there's not, a, it's, it's, it's not like that will change. And you go to the cafeteria or the, you know, residence lounge and there's just donuts around. It's just, it's part of the culture of food in America. Mm -hmm. And medicine isn't exempt from that. Um, so there's just not much, much focus on it. Even though if you point it out to someone, it's one of those things that's like, yeah, that is weird. Yeah. Yeah. Move on. Um, so it's like observed, accepted, and then nobody really does anything about it. There's actually a term for that. Um, a term for like when you notice something and it irks you, but you don't care enough to do th anything about it. Like observing that there's a sticker on a piece of fruit. Mm -hmm. Literally right. a word for it where you're like, this is stupid, but I'm not going to like, write a blog post about why fruits shouldn't have stickers on them. Yep. And so it, it yeah, right. that category where people just don't, don't take action, even if it's agreed to be an issue. Um, Nick, one of the things I wanted to ask you, you meant you touched on the fact that your, your inflammatory markers decreased by eightfold. I think you said how long of a period of time did it take you to actually get the number down by that much? One week. Wow the fuck at one week at one week it was there um oh, i yes. probably was quite a potent responder um but for me yeah the calpro dropped in a week it went from like 160 to 20 or something like that um with 50 being the threshold of normal so like went to three times the high threshold of normal to just well with a normal range it, um, and you see this actually across a spectrum of inflammatory diseases like um, i don't know if you know russell winwood on twitter he goes by um, COPD athlete. He's an Australian guy, uh, uh, middle-aged, older guy, around 56. And, um, well, based on his name, you can tell what condition he had. He had chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, a respiratory lung disease. Mm -hmm. uh, and when he went keto, his lung inflammatory markers, we actually had a panel of six of them. I worked with some pulmonologists to write up this case report, which we ended up publishing. But, like, his lung function markers went up tremendously, his FEV1 which is the forced expiratory volume in um, one second, like went up 35%. Um, and he had like a panel of six inflammatory markers who just across the board, just plummeted. Um, and his athletic performance improved. The guy's like, he has, he has COPD and he's in his probably close to 60 now running marathons. Wow. He was supposed to be like by 60, you know, 
maybe almost dead. So um, wow. somebody took out, but like, yeah, it's it's again one of these things where I'm observing that various what do you ever you want to call them inflammatory, some autoimmune, whatever diseases are responding to this, and at least some people might be worth investigating a little bit further, um, especially because the standard of care for these conditions really isn't that great. It's just kind of like managed. And sometimes with really potent drugs, like um, I think, Brett, you tried some of the you know, standard immunosuppressant drugs that are like ridiculously expensive yep. and systemic immunosuppressants. Um, yes. That you know you might not want to be on if there's another option than taking a three hundred thousand dollar per year systemic immunosuppressant it might be worth trying. So um, it, I just find it interesting that it does seem a decent number of people are responding to this. I wish there was more will to do these studies, and if at some point I develop the resources to be the one to do them, then that's great. But right now, I don't have a couple million dollar grant to toss around mm. required to actually kind of do this kind of research. So. Yeah, Nick, what are some of the most common side effects associated with these biologics and immunosuppressants for anyone that's not incredibly familiar with them? Um, I prefer not to go down the, the rabbit hole of speaking too much about medications, just okay. because you get in trouble about that, um, given my position. But let's just say you're systemically suppressing your immune system and what can come with that. Mm. Okay. Also, depending on what other comorbidities you have. But yep. um, yeah, some people respond to them. I think some of these drugs are phenomenal and, and really life-saving, life-changing. Um, I just think that, you know, not irritating the immune system in the first place might be a place to start. And potentially for some patients, a way to circumvent the need for these drugs, especially if you can't afford them. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of the times, it just this is standard with pharmacology, like, the first line drugs will not necessarily be the best for you. They'll just be the cheaper ones. Mm. So you'll get some, you know, for um, colitis, you get the systemic immunosuppressants are going to be prescribed before um, something like Intibio, which is a local gut immunosuppressant. And it's just because Intibio is otherwise more expensive. So it probably is better for you, but your insurance company is not going to cover it until you fail another drug first. Interesting. Um, and this is true across the board. I mean, if you think about diabetes, like TZDs and um, sulfonylureas are, I think, the least expensive. And those are the two drugs that are probably going to cause weight gain. So sulfonylureas, they work by just increasing the basal level of insulin that's released um, mm -hmm. and tend to cause weight gain as opposed to like a GLP-1 agonist, which actually can cause weight loss. So if you're thinking about a disease like diabetes, you know, like just looking at the pure biological effects, increasing incretin effect, you might get some weight loss. I'd probably go for a GLP-1 for a patient rather than a sulfonylurea, but the sulfonylurea is going to be less expensive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, based on those dynamics and other things, you might end up getting drugs that are, okay, now I'm already digging myself into a rabbit hole talking about drugs. You see where I'm going. It's like, yeah. the calculus gets complicated experimenting with lifestyle interventions, which as you pointed out, Harry, is pretty low risk. Like what's going to happen from just giving ketogenic diet a try for like four weeks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or one week. <laughs> yeah, one week. I mean, like you really screw it up. Maybe you get a keto flu or, you know, maybe some like constipations and diarrhea, like, okay, fine. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. or you could change your life, like me and Brett, and just like have a whole new direction. It's not, it's changed my life in a million ways. My academic interests, my career interest and brought me back to health. Right. I was literally just from like that one week experimentation. I'm like, ah, oh, what do I have to lose? Right. Mm -hmm. Nice if patients didn't have to get to that point of extreme desperation where they have to try it, where they can get a little support from their clinical team or um, or others. And the really nice thing about freedom of information in the age of the internet, Twitter, Clubhouse, etc., is that I think those communities are arising mm -hmm. where people can get support. And maybe it's not professional medical support probably should be working with the doctors but at least that you know there are some other rabbit holes where people can find hope and options to try so i feel like anyway i think that's a positive thing yeah so, so nick with uh what was it about the ketogenic diet was it the anti-inflammatory nature of it or what would you really attribute the success of trying the ketogenic diet to yeah that's a hard one i mean i've looked down the rabbit hole of the literature. And there's some really interesting effects of, of, um, 
of ketogenic diets on the gut in terms of potential effects on the microbiome and in various models affect the beta hydroxybutyrate is very important for intestinal stem cell renewal. Um, the fact that if you have an inflammatory bowel disease, that beta hydroxybutyrate might be able to replace um, butyrate as an energy substrate because you might not be able to take it up as much if you have inflammatory bowel disease. There's a lot of things that I could speculate about. But um, just to get to the, the, for me, the brass tacks of it, what I find is that um, my symptoms, first of all, are in terms of the colitis symptoms, pretty much absent as long as I'm in ketosis. And every time I've tried to come out of ketosis, usually for just life flexibility and social reasons, those are the only times that I'm really at risk of having a flare, of having blood in the stool again, um, and uh, formation of ulcers and, and calpro rises. Um, but also more interestingly, I noticed that like my other symptoms will correlate with or inversely correlate with my ketone levels. So at the beginning of this process, I tracked my ketone levels religiously. And I got to this point where I noticed I could guess my ketone levels based on how my gut was doing. Wow. Mm. Um, so wow. like, it could be the kind of thing where before I measure my ketones, I'm like, I feel this way. I literally write down, I think my ketone levels are X. Like you get a sixth sense for it. And I can reliably be within 0.2 millimoles. Wow. Um, based on my, my gut symptoms. So you do like develop a sixth sense for it. Just like if, you know, you're wearing a CGM and you kind of can tell if I'm having, you know, a hypoglycemia or a hypoglycemic episode, my blood sugar is doing this. Everybody's very different. But by tracking it over time, I found like, wow, I can tell based on how I'm feeling where my ketone levels are. And there were like thresholds for me where like, I'm feeling really bad. I'm like, oh, I know I'm below 0.7 this mm -hmm. morning. Mm -hmm. So my, you know, there's, things I could speculate upon as to why it's helping me. Um, but I was, you know, I have experienced that as long as I'm ketosis, I'm, I'm pretty good. As long as I'm eating a clean ketogenic diet, I'm mm -hmm. pretty good. Um, be that carnivore. And I've tried all sorts of ketogenic diets or more plant-based keto. Um, and I've tried different things at different times for different use cases. Um, but for me, I think it is more of the clean ketosis than per se the elimination. Mm. Um, whereas for other people, I think, you know, whether or not you're in ketosis, the pure elimination has the biggest impact. For example, there are people that are pure carnivore that have tremendous success, at least anecdotally with various autoimmune diseases, even if they're not in ketosis. So mm. I think it's very different for different people in terms of, you know, what are the major contributing factors? For me, I do think that there is a big contribution of the beta hydroxybutyrate in the system. Mm. Could you uh, could you explain beta beta hydroxybutyrate just at a basic level in in that how how it functions in the body? Yeah, um, high level beta hydroxybutyrate is the ketone body, the major one that's circulating in your bloodstream. So when you go into ketosis, your body is shifting from dependency on glucose as a primary fuel source to fat as a primary fuel source. The fat is released from adipocytes, fat cells around your body, fuels those cells and also goes to the liver. And those fatty acids can be turned into ketone bodies, primarily beta hydroxybutyrate, and also some acetoacetate um, that can fuel the brain and other tissues. Um, if you didn't have ketogenesis, what would have to happen is if you didn't have carbs, you'd have to generate more and more glucose by the process of gluconeogenesis. And that would catabolize or break down lean tissue and you'd waste away very, very quickly. At least, mm. you know, evolutionarily speaking, we, you know, you had to go for a, for a prolonged fast. You just eat away all your muscle tissue to feed your brain and then you die of, uh, of muscle wasting. So there's that aspect of it. It is just an alternative fuel to glucose to feed your brain and various other tissues. But I think the more interesting aspect for me is the fact that it's a signaling molecule. So People talk about beta hydroxybutyrate as, or ketones in general, as like a fourth macronutrient um, or a great brain fuel. Uh, um, for me, I think that there's a second nature that's not talked about nearly enough, and that's it as a signaling molecule. So, what we know is beta hydroxybutyrate has like hormonal effects. When I say signaling it, it goes and binds to receptors on cell surfaces, like 
GPR 109A. It's just also called HPAR2. So if you protein couple receptors, it can go in cells and change epigenetic regulation by inhibiting uh, histone deacetylases. Uh, it can even modify proteins. You might have heard of post-translational modification of proteins when proteins have things added to them that changes their function. So there's like acetylation, methylation. There's now we know beta hydroxybutyrylation, where the beta hydroxybutyrate binds to the protein and will change its function. And on last count, I think there's like 1,400 different proteins that are beta hydroxybutyrylated and have their functions changed. The bottom line is like, this is a fuel substrate, but it's also a very potent signaling molecule on multiple levels that can just shift metabolism mm. in ways to have effects like improving stem cell renewal in the gut, inhibiting the NLRP3 inflammasome. There's so many effects that are just beginning to be elucidated. Um, so yeah, that's my pseudo simplified answer for what beta hydroxybutyrate is. No, um, the thing that you measure when you take a ketone blood stick, you stick your finger and get a ketone level, you're measuring beta hydroxybutyrate. Gotcha. Got it. Nick, do you think that it's important for people to actually check their ketone levels? And the reason why I say that is that um, both Clemenza and I have stuck to a lower carb approach for a few years now. We definitely are animal-based. Um, we've used CGMs, but I have not gone as far as to actually check my ketone levels. Um, so do you do, do you think that's an important practice for people? I'd say different strokes for different folks. Like yeah. for me, it was interesting. And for me, it had utility. If you're using it for a neurological condition, um, experimentally for mood issues or for epilepsy or something, then it's definitely important. Um, but for other conditions, you know, it, it might be a cherry on top, so to speak, but it might not be necessary. So for example, you know, diabetes, I think a CGM will be a, a lot more useful, whether or not your ketosis isn't as important as how stable your blood sugar is. It's just one more data point. And if you want to explore that, then fine. Maybe you find something great. And if you're not comfortable sticking your finger, I don't think it's absolutely essential. Um, for those who do want to try to be really carb restricted, I think it can be kind of motivating because if you're in ketosis, it definitely means that it's proof that you're really, really low carb. Um, but just because you're not in ketosis doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. So mm -hmm. say you're, you know, high protein, low, you know, moderate fat, low carb, if you're having a lot more protein, you're doing more of a PE thing, your ketones might not be that low. Um, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Again, it doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. It's just, um, it's just one more biomarker to measure. And it really depends on what your use case is. For me, it was useful. I don't think it's hundred percent necessary for everybody, but I can't make a broad general relation on that. Got it. Um, and, and I know one of the, the key differences between us, even though there's so many similarities, I, I healed my stomach using a lot of red meat in particular, a lot of beef products. And I know that you are an advocate for a Mediterranean low carb approach. That's worked very well for you. Can you touch on a little bit about what kind of pulled you towards the Mediterranean approach, more fish, et cetera, and just maybe touch on what like a typical day of eating looks like for you, for you to be successful and stay in remission? Yeah. Um, first, I want to clarify, I'm not an advocate of any particular ketogenic diet. I've been mm -hmm. carnivore. Um, I started out my journey as more Mediterranean, just because okay. that's where my mindset was in terms of what looked healthy, what was healthy. Now, I've come to the point where I, I'm i not as convinced. Um, and I'm, I no longer am of the mindset that things like red meat are bad, or even that a fully carnivore diet is bad. I'm not of that opinion. So it's just where I started. Mm -hmm. um, and also branding around that, I think has been useful for me, just practically speaking on a couple of levels. Um, just because of where I'm positioned uh, in my career academically and at my institution, it's nice to be able to have that spin of, look, I'm going to talk about ketosis, but you can do it in a way that appears healthy to the general populace. So I just find that the Mediterranean keto thing is more palatable to the people I'm trying to access. Mm -hmm. For me, it's largely you know a practical thing so that I can go to people and say, look, I know that ketosis has this bad name, but I want to show you this picture of salmon and avocado and just open your mind to it because that's how my mind is open to it. That's mm -hmm. where I started before thinking, oh, wow, like carnivore actually could be plausible. For most people, 
jumping from the standard approach to like the concept of carnivore is just too big a leap. So I consider myself kind of like a bridge. That's the whole Mediterranean uh, diet thing, Mediterranean keto thing. Um, so I've, I've, I've dabbled with all sorts of things. Quite honestly, it, it comes down to just my taste preference. I am a fish guy. I love fish. Nothing against a steak, but mm. like if you could cook me good, you know, salmon putinesca versus a ribeye, I would go for the salmon putinesca with, you know, or the like smoked salmon with mozzarella cheese and olives and capers. It's just my taste preference. That's Got it. Okay. Um, okay. It's not that I, I think carnivore is, it, it's just what I, what I like to eat, quite honestly. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, a typical day of eating for me always changes. Right now, I'm really dabbling with fermented foods. Mm. Um, that's a whole other podcast in and of itself. But right now, I'm eating a lot of um, like kimchi, sauerkraut, fermented olives, kefir, um, natto, um, and, and, and dabbling with various other things. So uh, I've been, been playing with that. And then for experimental purposes, just different fat ratios, fiber and stuff. But that's all just kind of like I'm always doing self-experiments. So yeah, for me, it's just a taste preference thing. I think that carnivore is fine. I think that plant-based keto is fine. It depends on what you like, to be perfectly honest, and what works for you. If you know plants better, you don't eat plants. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I think different people have different sensitivities. The one thing I would put forward as a provocative thought question for people is, I think t- sometimes like the short term uh, or, or the things that improve your sh- symptoms in the short term might not be the best for you in the long term. And in part, I'm speaking about carnivore for certain people. I'm like, if you do a full on elimination, your symptoms might go away, but I'm not entirely convinced that it could be the best thing for you in the long term. Um, because you're not challenging your system mm. with certain, I'm trying to use words that aren't going to get me in trouble with uh, people on social media, but it's probably impossible. Um, they're not going to challenge your system in a way that's going to make it adapt uh, in a healthy manner. So like, you know, let's think of the concept of microbiome diversity. Um, if you don't eat, things that could promote microbiome diversity, you might have reduced symptomology, Mm -hmm. but it might also hinder your ability to respond to an environmental challenge, let's call it, that's coming from either food or other sources um, in future, just a possibility. Uh, Personally, I'd be more comfortable if my gut could tolerate you know, more food challenges. I think it's it's a marker of a healthier microbial um, and overall, um, you know, meta meta biological system that you can respond to different challenges or more diverse challenges. You know, it's analogous to exercise. If you can do more things physically, it probably is an indication that you're in physical, better physical shape than if you can only do a few movements. Um, that's not to say that everybody has to go to that length, but I just I'm on the fence. I'm really like, I, I, I really don't know. I really don't know if there's a huge downside to being pure carnivore in terms of overall optimal health. Um, and I definitely think for some people that's not even in the cards. So don't do something that's gonna cause you serious issues. But for me, I'm at the point right now where like I can kind of have enough buffer room to dabble. And so I just like to play with things um, with, without being prescriptive to other people. So yeah, right now I just, I think all these things are interesting and I really encourage everybody to experiment um, in a manner that they find comfortable um, and tolerable. But I'm always a fan of like, never saying this is the way and always just tweaking things a little bit because you might find something else just works a little bit better. If I weren't, you know, tweaking things or trying things that were out of my comfort zone, I never would have tried keto. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know that there is a best human diet. I don't know if there is a best ketogenic diet. I really does do think it varies for different people. I'm pro carnivore. And if you've had success on whole food, plant-based or anything else, I'm pro whatever is mm-hmm. working for you. 
think we just need to listen to each other's stories and, and uh, you know, listen to each other open-mindedly so we can try things and help each other. But uh, yeah, I, I have no, no particular stake in any particular type. What resources would both of you guys recommend for people who are potentially running into some issues? Um, just in terms of, I, I think both of you guys have an athletic background, so it probably lent itself to you guys being more adaptable when it came to trying the ketogenic diet or, or experimenting a bit. But if people are really coming from a place of you know being at zero, what are some good resources for people to check out that might help them really start getting into that experimental mode when it comes to dieting? Well, you start, Brett. I've been talking too much. <laughs> no, I mean, you're you're the guest um, and you haven't been talking too much at all. It's been fantastic. I mean, I would say, yeah, I would say just going just, just off of an anecdotal experience, what worked well for me, um, Sean Baker's 2017 appearance on Rogan, I would say started to open up the floodgates for me because he really starts to document his own carnivore journey. Um, so I think that was foundational for a lot of people. It's also just a great episode, a great listen. He really outlines his approach there. So I think that's great. Um, also, there are there's either one or two Paul Saladino episodes where he's interviewed on Rogan, where he outlines his approach. And he falls more into the animal-based approach where he was formerly carnivore. And now he implements things like honey, fruit, um, raw dairy into his diet. And also, I think Mark Sisson's blog, Mark's Daily Apple, is also a fantastic resource. He's kind of the paleo primal OG. And for anyone that doesn't know him, I think you should just do a quick Google search. He's 68 in an incredible shape. And he's been an interesting cat because he really started leading the, the, the paleo movement. And as time has gone on, he's really gravitated towards more of a ketogenic approach and also talks about a carnivore diet. But um, you know, there, there are a ton of different types of carnivore templates that, that you can follow. Um, but I would say that I think between, for me, I would say between Baker's podcast, some of Paul Saladino's resources and, and, and Mark Sisson's blog, there are th those three resources alone should give people a really good template just for kind of how to start and maybe structure like the first two weeks or first 30 days of some type of low, low carb carnivore diet. Um, that's, that's what I did, Nick. I don't know if you agree or if there's anything else that I'm missing there that you like. Yeah, I think the key things for most people to keep in mind when they start. Um, first, and I really emphasize this, the hardest thing about going low carb or going carnivore is not the diet. Mm-hmm. Most people don't complain about if you know if you like steak and eggs, eating steak and eggs, or if you like salmon and avocado, having salmon and avocado fries. The food is freaking good. You can make it delicious, especially if you can cook. So the problem is not the food. The problem is the social barriers. This can be difficult to do if you're entrenched in a community that's going to tell you either this is unhealthy, tempt you into eating things that are not going to be good for you, or otherwise don't have a support structure. So I think the first thing is to recognize that and think about how you can find that support structure in order to be successful. There's a few ways to do that. Um, one that I think is great is there's some communities on Clubhouse, which is an app where you can get on and actually like dialogue with other people. So you, you can do various keto rooms or low carb, or maybe there's carnivore rooms now. Um, you can get into Facebook groups, wherever you can find a community. I think that's really important so that you can get positive reinforcement along the way. I think that goes so far. Um, and if you can get your doctor on board, all the better. I always encourage people to work with their doctors wherever possible. So I think if you're going to take one thing from me, find a support structure and get prepared. Um, the other part of getting prepared is, you know, really figuring out, you know, what's in your repertoire to be able to cook and eat. You know, what is this going to look like for you? you know, reconfigure your food environment. You're going to have a really hard time if you have cereal in the pantry and, you know, easy carbs all around. At some point, you're just going to break down. So what are going to be your go-tos? If you're someone who likes to snack, what is that going to look like for you? Is it going to be olives? Is it going to be some raw nuts? Is it going to be some hard-boiled eggs? Kind of think about that and have, you know, that in mind in some go-to recipes, mm -hmm. things that you can make easy on hand that you can meal prep, have in bulk. I think a lot of it comes down to preparation mm -hmm. and, 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 and knowing what is my food list. When I go shopping, 
you know, what can I get? Um, and what am I going to cook this week? So just formulating it and really taking it, um, you know, uh, a systematic approach to it before you give it a real go. And then when you give it a real go, give it a full chance. Mm -hmm. The yeah. number of times people are like, yeah, I tried keto, but it was for a week. And, you know, it was really hard because, you know, I didn't know what to cook and eat and then I gave up. Like, it happens all the time. Um, and I understand why, because a lot of the time people don't have the support structure in the proper environment. So that's why I think getting prepared is so important and, you know, managing expectations. You could be profoundly insulin resistant. It could take you six weeks to adapt. You could not know how to manage your electrolytes so you can get the keto flu, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to, you know, figure out those things and troubleshoot them it comes up again and again. You might just hit a little roadblock. And it doesn't mean the diet is wrong. It could be just you're not getting enough sodium or your gut's just adapting. So you're having some diarrhea. It might not persist, but it could be the grass is really greener on the other side. Yeah. You just give it, got, got to give it a full go. So in addition to you know, the resources Brett pointed out, I just want to emphasize, you know, get prepared, which means figuring out what you're going to cook, what are your go-to foods, um, finding a community and then committing to, I'm going to give this a full genuine go, which means at least four weeks, if not six and committing to that in your head so that you don't give up prematurely. And if at the end of that it doesn't work then fine, but I think for most people, uh, it will, and you'll learn a lot along that journey. Mm, it's funny. Of, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Nick. I was just going to say, I was thinking about like in terms of my best podcasts, go-tos, I've really gotten into Huberman lab. Mm -hmm. I think he provides some really nuanced and um, balanced discussions around things that are just thought provoking for the lay public um, up to academics. Um, so I think he provides some, some great content to think about as well. Awesome. No, that's, that's amazing. And I think the community piece that you touched on is massive. And it's funny you mentioned that because that's literally what Clemenza and I are in, in the process of launching right now. It's actually starting on Monday, May 9th. It's a, we're calling it the seven days of action, which is really a guided framework and community. Where we're going to walk people through what does seven days of optimal health look like from a diet perspective, like foods to focus on, foods to avoid, recipes to incorporate. And then we're also making a discord group as part of that. So people can have, you know, there could be a community of 50 plus people that are all going through this process together. Um, and that's really what makes it sustainable, especially when you might be in an office where everyone's eating pizza or going to happy hours and you're trying to cook a pound of steak, um, it's just helpful to be able to rely on these tactics and strategies that you learn from other people just to really navigate that. So, I mean, we couldn't agree with you anymore. And that's really what we're trying to do through the seven days of action. Yeah. One more thing that I want to plug here. We talk a lot about keto adaptation, fat adaptation, carnivore adaptation. I want to interject a new term which I'm gonna call keto or carnivore or fat social adaptation. And what I mean by that, it has to do with what you just said, Brett. It's like, you know, when you're at, when you're that person who's the pariah and not having pizza at the pizza party, not having cake at the office party at the birthday party, at the beginning, it's gonna be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, people are gonna be like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. um, you know, just like your metabolism might be uncomfortable when you start, but you see this again and again, over time, you will see improvements. Um, you'll start feeling better. And then people are going to take notice and be like, okay, you know, I'm kind of getting fatter and less healthy and not doing great. And you're doing incredibly like what's going on with you. Mm -hmm. People are going to start turning to you as a model and you're going to start being a um, kind of a leader in your social circles in terms of diet. I don't know, like if you feel that way, Brett, but it's certainly been the way for me. Like when I started this, it was like, okay, it's awkward to go to my lab group and I'm going to order like, can I get the, you know, steak with a side of butter or a salmon with a side of mayonnaise and an avocado? They're like, what is this guy ordering? And yeah. then afterwards, it's like, you really turned your life around. Or like, you know, you're doing this, yes. that, the other. Like, I kind of want to know what you're doing. And, and then people gravitate towards you as a source of information. And then you can help other people. So it goes from you being a pariah to you being actually you know, quite a leader. So I think there's an aspect of like this social discomfort can actually turn into something very positive mm. if you give it a long enough chance. So not only is there metabolic adaptation, but I think there can be social adaptation as well. Um, 
and especially in the people in whom it's really visible, if you lose like 200 pounds, which I don't think you and I, Brad, it was, it, it was more of an invisible, invisible illness. So it wasn't quite as visible, but for a lot of people, you do see these, like, I dropped from like 300 pounds in an HbA1c of 12 to like mm-hmm. 150 in an HbA1c of 5.5. People are like, oh my God, like, what did you do? And then these people become very influential and can help their siblings, their parents, their friends. Um, so it's not just about your health. It's about the health of people around you. And um, yeah, I think, I think there's a social a- adaptation to it as well. Yeah, I don't want to speak for either of you guys, but it, it, it sounds like the the empowerment of turning the corner, like it, that first initial period of adjusting socially to some of these eating habits, it, it is, it, it can be weird. You're the one sticking out. But then once you really start seeing the benefits and people start acknowledging like, whatever you're doing is working. So <laughs> yeah. I think once, once you kind of, once you turn that corner, it becomes this empowering aspect of your life and it can also improve your demeanor, your attitude, your drive, uh, confidence. I think all those things are in play when you start really finding success with, you know, your nutrition and your health. Couldn't agree more. hundred percent. Um, Clemenza, do you, do you have any other questions that you, that you want to have Nick answer? I think this is a perfect discussion, uh, around, you know, what you guys have dealt with. I think a ton of people are going to get value out of just hearing what you guys have done to, turn the corner. So I don't have any other questions. This was a great combo. Yeah. And, and it is important to say this is part one. We are going to have Nick back on for part two to dig into some of the incredible work that he's putting together with, uh, with Dave Feldman as well. Um, so we're really excited to, to, to dig into that, but just understanding your story, Nick is so, so core to who you are. And like you mentioned, you know, you have this incredible ability to bring in all these different disciplines together. And it makes us really hopeful to see another younger guy, in Western medicine, that's, that's being proactive and speaking up and advocating for this approach. That's really changing lives for a lot of people. So, you know, appreciate the vulnerability, appreciate you coming, you coming on and tell your story. And we're just looking forward to, to, to part two and chopping it up even more with you. So thanks again. That's um, awesome. Yeah, no, I'm excited to, to uh, speak with you more as well. And, um, and super grateful for you and all the other you know, people who are willing to just share their stories at every level or contribute in any way, encouraging other people, inspiring other people with stories, or even just being open-minded and listening. I found that incredibly powerful when my, my peers, um, you know, my medical school peers are willing to listen to my story or listen to my questions, receive literature, and just be curious about it. That means so much to me. Um, and I think it means a lot to other people. If people are willing to listen and saying, wow, that's really powerful. I'm happy for you. Simple things like that yeah. uh, can go a long way. Just expressing interest in, in this area because I think it has the ability to, to change a lot of lives. And I'm really optimistic about the direction that um, the culture and medicine are heading. So. It's incredible insight. And, um, you know, I think you two are both great examples so you both need to keep up, keep up the great work, uh, just in terms of communicating, even though it, it does invite some vulnerabilities. I think you guys are both doing a great job leading and uh, speaking out about this stuff. Awesome. Absolutely. All right. Well, well, thanks again, Nick. We'll talk to you soon, okay? All right. All right.